Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. Hi, I'm Susan, and I'm a college counselor and have read applications for a small liberal arts college and two research universities. My twins are recent college graduates. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy has a bachelor's degree from the University of Georgia and a master's degree from North Carolina State University. She works in private practice in Raleigh as a mental health therapist. And I'm so blessed to be able to work alongside both my beautiful daughters at School Match for You, a college counseling firm that I founded in 2010. This week in the news, Susan and I continue our conversation with part two, our final part of Eric Hoover's excellent article in the Chronicle of Higher Education, a new push to assess character in admissions. Lisa and I discuss a speak pipe question sent in from Barbara. She wants to know what is the difference between direct admissions and rolling admissions. And Julie and I continue with the final part of our interview, which will also serve as our college spotlight, with Lee Coffin, the VP of Enrollment and Dean of Admissions at Dartmouth College. Sometimes there were there were students who fit a bit of a profile. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna unpack that because it would feel very prejudicial. And it's only one college. Sure. But sure. we began to become more familiar with the kinds of things we let get by us in the admissions evaluation, where things did not add up in a way where we probably should have let that student come into the class. You know, Susan, I have to say this, we because we did something similar. Well, you were a part of it. It wasn't as formal as yours. It was the student of concern meetings. Yes, <laughs> where the, yes. The whole 100 person faculty would talk about who they were concerned about or at the year I end. I remember well. Or the, the year end, there'd be conversations about who may not be invited back. And then we would go back and look. And I one thing that really stood out to me, now this is more of an academic thing than a character thing, but I learned it. I learned this by year two or year three, that when you admitted a kid that had a really high test score, but the grades were a little shaky, you normally got the grades, not the test score. That was a risky academic admit. And, you know, so many times you would see the potential because they're testing 99th percentile. And, you know, who knows what it what might have been. It could have been learning differences. It could have been emotional problems. You know, it, it, there's a lot of different reasons for that. And in some cases, things just click a little later maturity-wise especially for boys. Um, boy, you know, there's there's a lot of reasons why we see that profile sometimes of really high testing and and more tepid grades. But at least where you and I worked at, I found that we got, you know, we ended up getting the more tepid grades in terms of, like a lot of times those students were up for academic concern. Right. And, and it, one thing it did for me is it taught me not to be wowed by high test scores without without seeing other stuff to back it up. Very good point. That's very, and the, hence the whole holistic Correct. picture. And, and Mark, truthfully, it's when you're, the gap between male and female can be so At enormous. I mean, mm -hmm. in admi college admissions, we still saw the male female gap to, to a certain extent where, and sadly what that often meant is that you would cut male applicants a bit more slack. Sure when the trajectory was headed in the right direction, but the the girls for whom perfection was almost the standard expectation was, uh, and you just talked about this recently, actually, in, in a podcast, I forget who you were talking about it with, but you really nailed it because that male, female. Oh, D Dave and I, I think we were talking yes. about the gender. Yeah. The gender there, gap. It, it was the, definitely a thumb on the scale for boys. Yes. And yeah, the New York Times article. Yeah. And that, you know, that there's a little bit when a college has an institutional priority of of some gender 
parody or whatever parody it is that mm-hmm. it's looking for, you're making allowances to bring the balance into the community that you think provides educational value, you know, for everybody. But, I, you know, I just really wanted our listeners to know that colleges have been paying attention to personal qualities for a long time, but each school has to spend time figuring out what predicts success. You know, whether like my experience, the small liberal arts college or the big, you know, look at Drexel or Northeastern or, uh, you know, DePaul or Berkeley, whatever. Everybody has to have their own sense of what those predictors of success are. And, you know, at, at Bates, we were in the early 80s removing testing as a requirement. So we had our equity and access hats on way before a lot of other institutions, right? There were a lot of schools that weren't even really caring about that, but being in, um, and and God bless the Bates community right now too, they've been through a lot. The city of Lewiston has been through a lot. Our hearts have been with them. For those of you who don't know, Bates is right in Lewiston where that that tragic 18-person shooting. Yeah. I haven't been there for, you know, several decades, but I sure knew every street they mentioned and yeah. got in very, very quick touch with <laughs> yes. my my former colleagues and, and friends there. And but the you know, identifying what it is that predicts success and that takes in-house research. You know, admissions needs to be in conversation with the faculty, with the residence hall directors, with the coaches, with, you know, everybody under the sun at an institution to understand how their school measures success. Because that's another word that means really different things. Um, and, and, you know, part of the optional SAT research that everybody's been engaged with since the 1980s, uh, the, the dozens and dozens of schools that moved there before the, the pandemic um, really hung their hats on a clarity around how they were going to be evaluating students, um, both academically and personally for their institution. Um, the pandemic meant colleges went into that blind, but all of them, while they might not have ever experimented or considered the absence of test scores, they all had done um, institutional research over the decades on predictors of success. So especially like Bates, which, you know, bread and butter, independent schools, high-end public schools in New England and the Northeast, right? But then an enormous population of Northern New England public school kids, right? It's an almost a, a bifurcated applicant pool. And that was half the fun, of course, of of that. But one population of kids who, to whom much had been given, <laughs> right? And much right. was expected. Much was expected of those kids personally and academically. And then there were kids who had much less opportunity, much less uh, handed to them in terms of, uh, you know, their skids weren't greased, let's put it that way. Of course, much was expected of them too, but they were measured, their readiness for the college academically and personally was measured differently. And those were the kids for whom grit, perseverance was measured um, for a hundred years because these were kids who were going countercultural perhaps to their families, backgrounds, and any college that deals with a lot of first gen um, or kids from mixed socioeconomic status backgrounds know that their the yardsticks have to be very very different so do you think that this stuff can be quantified in a in a way where there can be scales and there can be sort of rubrics attached to character or do you think oh boy you know you're really going down a slippery slope here some things are are just subjective you can't quantify everything you know um, what are your thoughts on that? Because there were some there was some talk in the article about these things can be measured and we can come up with ways 
Um, I, I mean, I'm hearing you say it's got to be individual for each school. I think you're saying that loud and clear. I, I'm asking something a little different. Like, do you think this can be done in a way where where metrics can be assigned? Or do you think it's just... Absolutely. Okay. All right. Great. That's helpful uh, to no, hear that. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. The science behind this, Mark, is proven. Mm -hmm. Colleges um, now, we're seeing so much more research. Well, you know, for our listeners... Let's go back and think about what the milestone research, scholarly researchers have done for this movement. And I was thinking in my own in my own mind, 2006, Carol Dwork out of sure. Stanford with mindset, yeah, growth mindset, fixed mindset, tremendous research out of the Stanford Graduate School of Education on predicting uh, predicting success based on qualities of of mind, mind and spirit, but mostly mind. Angela Duckworth uh, came out with a TED Talk in 2016. And parents, if you're listening and you want to hear a blow your mind, groundbreaking piece of, of uh, work on this, um, Angela Duckworth, who heads the character lab at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, TED Talk, excuse me, 2013, April, called Grit. This, this revealed a lot of her research and preceded her publication three years later. That's where the 2016 came in. But the TED Talk, uh, and I remember hearing her at a conference, in fact, before the book was published. Um, so it must have been about 2013, 2014, on grit, the power of passion and perseverance, and the longitudinal predictors of success, not just in college, but in life, in career, in relationships in parenting, which have been the focus of her research on um, passion and perseverance as opposed to measures of intelligence. Uh, so the, the TED Talk in 2013, the book in 2016, Harvard uh, Graduate School of Education founded the Making Caring Common project shortly thereafter under the leadership of Rick Weisbord, who um, is a scholar in moral and ethical development. And he has carried forward, perhaps, um, along with the Penn Character Lab, some of the, the leading research on measuring personal qualities um, and using them as predictors of what it is you're trying to predict. Uh -huh. Right? So the, the, the point at the end of what you're trying to predict has to kind of proceed, you know, what then how you go about doing it. But his focus was moral and ethical development. And as many of you know, the Making Caring Common Project has had enormous impact on the college admissions process and how colleges assess character. Um, Duckworth and Weisbord were the leading consultants when, when the Character Collaborative came to be, 2014. Um, and I was very, very fortunate to be on the founding board of the Character Collaborative when I, I was still that. at Westtown. And um, having the Quaker School perspective, Mark, of course, for me, you know, a tradition deeply rooted in humanity. Brennan was involved in that as well, wasn't he? Brennan? Not not at first. Not, not at first. Later, yeah. he certainly did, and he actually has become far more prominent, mm -hmm. largely through his work at making caring common. But he has has very definitely been a a high impact person with the Character Collaborative. Uh, so, 2014, Bill Hiss at Bates published a groundbreaking scholarly paper called "Defining Promise." which was a, a longitudinal study of 33 public and private universities on the predictive value of, or lack thereof, of standardized testing and what happened to colleges when they began to lay aside that requirement. So Susan, what should our listeners take away? Like what can, what do, would you want them to apply? Well, I think the reason why I'm giving this little history lesson is the jump then to 2020, when the first research started coming out on how ca colleges were actually assessing character in their admission process. It didn't just happen out of thin air. 
you know, it's very important as you think about the squishiness or the, you know, hey, we're not in this to measure whether people are good or bad. Sure. That we've got to lay that aside and think about um, what we're talking about here. And um, parents and kids need to do this. They need to understand what it is that colleges are actually measuring when they read an application. Um, 2023, the National Association for College Admission Counseling now has taken over leadership of the Character Collaborative, and they're they're forming a research hub um, in light of the test optional movement, the Supreme Court decision, and the lifting up of the access and equity mission of colleges of all kinds all around the country. So the momentum for this, and I, it's really important that parents understand that this didn't happen out of, of thin air, that there is a scholarly body of work that they can look up. You know, they can look it up. They can, can Google it. They can go to the Character Collaborative website and have a whole list of scholar, scholarly resources, but they need to go college by college to see what are the schools saying about this? And are they giving away any information about how these non-cognitive, aka personal qualities, are being measured? So the Character Collaborative has come out with several documents and videos on assessing character in the college admission process. One is for high school teachers and counselors to help them understand how to write recommendations in a way that brings students to life instead of just reprising a resume and focusing on met metrics of achievement, which is important for Pete's sake, we all know that, sure. but how, how they can in their descriptions of kids focus on bringing those, those non-cognitive qualities to life. And what does that mean? Does it just say that, you know, Mark was an enthusiastic, um, student who always did his homework and helped other kids in the classroom. Well, you got to start getting a little more specific than that. If you know a student well, what do you say? Another one of the courses, the short courses, is for essay writing, evaluating and advising the essay process with character in mind. Wonderful resource. Great workshop material for anybody who helps kids write essays, English teachers, guidance counselors, IECs, um, parents, you know, you name it. So one takeaway would be to, to look, look at what, look at how a school, what is, how a school self describes their process, what they look for and see whether or not you're fit as one way of assessing. That's right. If a school is a place for you is add this component I, in I your, agree. in, in, in into your list beyond just some of the common things that people tend to do like size and location and major absolutely and that's where a lot of similar looking and feeling colleges will differ now they may not differ enough to really matter mm -hmm. to a family i mean my earlier example of you know um you know, Villanova and BC is kind of a funny one, right? It's like, well, do you like Boston more than right. <laughs> you like Philly or, but I think even more important for families, Mark, is students working more closely around areas where they, they feel they know where these qualities reside in themselves and how do their choices of activities reflect those that self-awareness that the teenager um, is developing and moving beyond a resume mindset, which is kind of a fixed mindset, to a growth mindset of, is this just all about me earning an award, a, 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 a certificate, an element of status, a leadership title, or what is my involvement, just like we were saying at the beginning of this podcast, is my involvement reflective of bringing others along with me, uh, lifting, lifting the experience of others in my joy? That I love robotics so much. 
<laughs> but how am I lifting others, um, you know, in that way? Or I, I teach at Hebrew school at my synagogue um, because it's I get points toward my, you know, I started because I got points toward my bat mitzvah, but then it really began to be deeply meaningful to me. So how kids write about their activities, how they cho choose to show initiative and engagement, you know, it's a different mindset. The other thing is this horrendous thing that we call the brag sheet, which I wish is a term we could just lay down and find some other way to say it. But, you know, a lot of, especially larger high schools say, you've got to bring me these brag sheets so I can write a recommendation for you. And what the kids basically bring in is some form of resume that really is quite disconnected from their personal relationship with that teacher. Susan, I'm going to have to make that the final word. I'm going to have to make that the final okay. word only, only because I have a student from LA calling me in one minute. <laughs> not because oh, I didn't okay, want I'm to, sorry. No, 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 not because I didn't want to hear more of what you had to say. So, uh, but hopefully this whet everybody's appetite to think about this perspective as you look at colleges that are matched for your student. And Susan, thanks as always, and we'll look forward to you next month. You're welcome. Yeah, take care. Thanks, Susan. And now it's time for a question from one of our listeners. So, Lisa, very excited. Barbara's one of our real, definitely in the listening family, someone who never misses an episode and has a fair amount of engagement with us through the throughout the course of the year. And listeners like that um, inspire me. And I personally loved this question. So the next thing you'll hear, listeners, is Barbara's question. Hey, Mark, it's Barbara from Akala. I hope you're doing well and your journey towards your health is getting better and better every day. Loved your last update. I'm wondering if you would be able to take a moment on an episode and address for listeners the issue of direct admit colleges versus rolling admissions. I myself have become confused about it and have been trying to make sense of it. I'm hoping that maybe uh, this is something that you can speak to, as I'm sure there are many others out there who are trying to understand what the differences are. Much appreciated. Uh, your show continues to inspire me, my students, and my colleagues. Uh, so happy to be a part of it. Okay. Do you want to start or do you want me to start on this one, Lisa? you want to feed off of what I say or do you want to start? Me or you? I can, I'm flexible. I think I will start because Go I ahead. think I understand this, but maybe I'm wrong. So jump in if I am. I, I know I don't have to tell you that. Um, <laughs> so I think direct admit schools are schools that admit kids who haven't applied to them, but they have some information about those students. And so they offer them admission. So for instance, like say like universities in South Carolina are now auto admitting the top 10% of um, the high school rank of all students in South Carolina. So those kids, they didn't apply. They're just going to get letters uh, offering them admission to the school. Um, I know like Washington and Jefferson, one of the schools that I visited recently, they use like niche and other college websites. And if they see that a student um, is interested and they've indicated their GPA on the website, they will make an offer of admission to them without them applying. Rolling admissions is you have to, you, you have to fill out the application, you have to apply. Um, it's just, they don't have a hard and fast deadline. They get an application, they admit or they don't, and then they just keep going with that. So you're not going to get one decision day, like, you know, January 10th, like some schools, it's just going to be, as soon as they make a decision on you, they let you know. Did I do that right? Yeah, pretty close. I was like, you know, really close. So um, everything on rolling admissions, <laughs> yeah. you said was 100% <laughs> right on rolling admissions, right? Like the thing with rolling admissions is applications roll on in, decisions roll on out. And it's interesting with them because you will look at a rolling admission school and it might say a deadline of like July after you're out of high school, but that's not really a deadline. I mean, they, they, they keep admitting until they fill. And right. with rolling admission schools, a lot of times it is advantageous to be early because if they have a banner year or they have a more selective program, then it can get more competitive to get in over time. So 
we encourage people with rolling admissions to treat them similar to like how you treat like an early action or even an ED right. school. Like, let's get it in between August and October, you know, for, for rolling admissions. And you'll see it tends to be public schools. There are private schools that do rolling admissions, too. But, you know, you have to be careful with this because, you know, there are region, a lot of regional publics do rolling and some flagships do do rolling. And you do see some public private private schools that do rolling. Not as many of the most selective schools in the country do it, but there are exceptions. So that's rolling. And you're 100% right on that. There's not one date when decisions are made. Like, as, as they kind of go into a stack and a pile and they get read as they come in and, and then they get released. Um, so the thing with direct admissions, this question really excited me because uh, I've been wanting to do an in the news. Like, we've done one or two on it before, but. Um, this thing is growing and it is growing fast. And so, you know, I'm going to make a statement and I've been thinking about this for about the last month. If people were to think about what are the most significant changes in college admissions in the last five to 10 years, um, you know, there's a number of things that people would, would think of. Some people might talk about things like the new adaptive SAT or someone might even say the new FAFSA and that's certainly the, the growth of the test optional movement. Or some people might say the affirmative action decision and others would be on that conversation. That's why 2023 was such a big year. Like some of these major things all happened in 2023. Um, but I really think, and I could be wrong, but I really think Lisa five years from now, probably what will be the biggest thing is going to be the growth of what's sometimes called direct admissions, sometimes called guaranteed admissions, and it has a lot of other names as well. Because this thing is growing and it's growing in leaps and bounds. And um, Common App is really pushing it hard and doing a lot of research and rolling out things. Niche has a plan. The stuff that that um, EAB, you know, that took over, took over CapEx and College Greenlight, they've got a huge plan. Um, we've talked about it once or twice. Like you may remember me talking about, like, I was involved in bringing this to Atlanta as part of a rollout. Like, it happened. In, so what's it? Let me just talk about what the it is. So there's been so much talk about this complicated admission process that we go through, where we have people send all this information in and pay this money. And, you know, it's like it's every school's different. You got to figure it all out. Well, Another term that's that's uh, used for this is flipped admissions. Um, that's a term EAB likes to use, flipped admissions. And so somebody came up with a pretty brilliant idea, which is what if we have, what if we give schools access to a database? And let's face it, most schools are just admitting students off of a transcript Right. They have they can see a transcript, but in the database, you could have test scores in there. And then the schools can just go in and pick who they want and give them an offer. And if you think about it, there's no application fee. There's there's no rejections. You never got a, you never got rejected. You just either got an offer from someone or you didn't get an offer. Um, it's super easy for the applicant. Uh, so EAB did a big thing in Chicago. They piloted this program, and it was extremely successful. Um, Jonathan is over that whole thing. And so um, I was involved. He reached out to me. Mark, we're going to Atlanta next. I spent actually a fair amount of time with it. Atlanta was a little more complicated, but it's moving forward here. They identified 10 states. But EAB is just part of one group pushing this. Like I said, niche and common and Common App are growing in gangbusters with this. And if you may remember after I went to NACAC last year, not 2023, 2022 in, in Houston, um, I, I quoted Angel Perez, even that I questioned it at the time. He said he thinks this may be the normative way admissions is done in 10 years. Instead of you applying and finding out if you get in or not, there's a database and people go in and, and offer the people that they want. I'm still not sure if he's going to be right on that, but I can tell you this, in the last 18 months, this thing is growing like gangbusters in terms of how fast it's spreading. And the the challenge that um, I, I think you're going to have with whether you want to call it flipped, guaranteed, direct admissions is 
it's not really that conducive to um, highly selective schools that do really complex holistic admissions because uh, some of the plans are a little bit more sophisticated than others because some of them have you go in and almost do like one essay. Um, and it's still the concept of you don't apply. People just go in and look at your essay and look at your transcript. Um, the way EAB's plan is set up, a counselor has to nominate you to be included. So there's not official recommendations, but you can, as an, as an admission officer, you can say, oh, these people have at least been vetted so that the counselor approves of them. So they're putting into putting in some safeguards besides just, okay, I see a good, I see a good tramps here, but how do I know you're not like, you know, you know, whatever, <laughs> going to blow the place up with your guns. Like there's some behavior, some behavioral things in place, some quality control. They're all a little different. There's right now what you have is a lot of different competing models of people doing it a little differently, but what they all have in common is you don't apply, um, Schools have access to a database, and they just make admission offers. The other thing that's growing, once again, this tends to be less selective schools. I haven't talked about it that much, but it's what sometimes called on-the-spot admissions, where you just show up with a transcript and you get an offer right away. It's kind of similar to that, but this is just really formalizing the process. And it's having... It's, it's going to have a lot of popularity. This is going to have a lot of popularity. One, a lot of people are pushing it. But people with big, big, big platforms, you know, like Jenny Rickard, uh, who's overcome an app. She's got a huge mega mic megaphone, and she's really behind this because a lot of people see this as a great way to bridge the access gap. They look at who's not applying, and they think this could be a great way. If you don't make people have to go through all this process of doing all this stuff and playing app fees and getting rejected, they just get offers. And then the way a lot of them are set up, like the way EAB's plan is, you, you don't only get an offer. You get an offer with money. So, um, and then think about right now how college is under assault. I mean, 2.5 million less kids in college right now. We've talked a lot about all the reasons why that's true. So the extent to which it gets harder and harder and harder for these schools to get kids, whatever it is, whether it's birth dearth or the anti-college movement or cost of college or all the competitor things that are out there, you can, you know, whether it's Google or, you know, Amazon's benefit plan and payment, all the different reasons, like, you're going to see creative things schools are going to kind of try to do to get more applications. And we're seeing that with the aggressiveness with early decision. But this is one of the ways. And so this is really seen by a lot of people as at least it's at least it's seen as the future for schools that are, let's say, admitting more than 60 or 70 percent of their kids. That's where all the popularity. That's where it's really been popular. It has not been popular at like the Johns Hopkins of the world and the Northwesterns and the Stanfords and the, you know, the Vanderbilts or the places just that um, are so selective that they want a lot more data. I mean, think about it. MIT and Georgetown still make you have your own application. You think they're going to go for something like this? No. And any other thoughts? No, I think, you know, I, I hope that it is um, the future because it just takes away a barrier like there are all these inherent barriers to people applying to college, which is kind of ridiculous if you think as a society we want a more educated population. Mm -hmm. But we make it really hard to apply. I mean, that's why you and really I have do. these jobs because yeah. it's so complicated. There are so many different pieces of the application you have to get together. Um, and so, like, I think for a lot of kids who don't have that help, like, it's really overwhelming and they, you know, probably back away from it. So, just to have an offer, like, yeah, that place seems pretty cool. Okay, I know what my financial aid is. Yeah, I'll just go there. I mean, think about how much less stressful that is for a kid and think about how much more likely that kid would be to consider going to college, you know, with without that. And so I, I really, I hope that is the way that things go. Um, I know like um, at Guilford College um, near me, they yeah. have like a couple days, Saturdays where you go, you bring your transcript you talk to somebody, you know, about what you want to do and they admit you on the spot, you know, and then they, they'll, you know, if you have your 
financial aid stuff, they might kind of give you a ballpark. I mean, just think about how much less stressful that is than writing eight zillion essays and, I know. you know, getting all these teacher recommendations and, you know, also it's less stressful for schools. I mean, think about how much work these poor guidance counselors have to do in these schools where there's like a 400 to one <laughs> ratio of students to that counselor. I mean, so it just seems like it's so much more efficient. I agree that every single thing you said, Lisa, um, I'm really glad you took that time to do that because in some ways, every single person benefits. Now, even if you are from a more well-resourced family and there's not an, any issue at all with things like paying app fees and traveling and visiting schools and all these kinds of things, and maybe you're working with a private class counselor or you're in a really good school district or something, even, even that some of maybe your aspirational schools may not do this. Even we have know this and we've experienced this. It's still good to have some schools and maybe they're more in your probable bucket to get a few early admits in. Like that can take a lot of stress off even for that kid to get a couple acceptances. So I actually see application of this process for every type of applicant in the process. Yeah. I know I'm not, I'm not holding out breath that this, that the, you know, 50 to 100 most selective schools in the country are going to embrace this. But I'll tell you something. I mean, the University of Rochester is is in that group, one of the 100 most selective schools, and EAB was able to work out some custom things for them that they were able to participate. Um, so there's, you know, it's still in its embryonic phase, but uh, this is something that we'll continue to come back on because in my opinion, this is one of the biggest developments certainly you know in the last few years and i think potentially even in our lifetime like i mean yeah, this flipped yeah. admissions thing i mean i i actually think it's possible that angel perez might be right that this may be the way more people i don't know if it'd be 10 years from now but i mean at the rate at which it's growing it's really really catching on and and people are going to start hearing a lot about it. i mean just this week there were so many articles, you know, you know, Georgia is doing it. I just read an article on that uh, yesterday. And then before that, and the, uh, I can't remember the name of school, but it seems like almost every day. That, now, one of the things that's confusing is you are seeing different terms. You know, sometimes you're seeing it called direct admission. Sometimes you're seeing it called guaranteed admission. Sometimes you're seeing it called flipped admissions. And there's a fourth term that is just escaping me right now. So that, like anything, of course, we have to make everything complicated. But that's adding to the confusion. It's also adding to the confusion that there's, a lot of people out here that are sort of doing their own version. There's a lot of talk about score and score and their partnership with slate and what they're going to do with this. When slate has, you have all the access to all that information between score and slate. Like there's a lot of talk that they're going to take on the common app as, as a rival. And like, this isn't, this isn't talk that's coming from like, like just, Joe blow on the street corner, you know, just popping off. Like these are some really educated in the loop informed people. I know that I had a conversation with somebody pretty high up about this and they weren't going to tell me, you know, anything, but the, all the body language and everything indicated to me, like, we're not stupid. We see the potential. So that's another interesting thing to, to keep an eye on, but I'm probably going off on a tangent, but yeah, keep an eye on this space and we owe it to you to keep, you know, keep giving you updates. Um, we got several articles that are, you know, that I've been in touch with our other co-hosts about talking in the news on this. So uh, you want to say something, Lisa? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I just was going to say that I think in a way, like have, if direct admissions does become more popular, it's going to make the non top 100 schools more attractive and mm -hmm. decrease the attractiveness of those top 100 schools. Because I mean, there are always going to be places that people want to go. But if you can have something where you don't make any effort, it's pretty good. Or you can make a lot of effort, most likely you're going to get rejected. I think that's going to increase the attractiveness of the school that gives you um, the direct admit. It's just a thought. Yeah. I, I mean, I think there, there's an aspect of the most selective schools that their exclusivity partly adds to their appeal. And so I think there'll be an aspect of that that they will sort of work to their favor. I really do. But I'm looking at the potential of this. Like, think about rural communities. You know, we, you and I took a right. question, you know, pretty recently about this, right? I mean, you know, like hardly anybody travels there. They already have massive imposter syndrome. They already feel nobody, like, I don't, I don't think, 
I don't think I would like them. I don't think they would like me. Like, that's the way a lot of people feel in first gen under resource circles. Um, right. It's a very, right. very welcoming move, you know, um, to make people feel like, oh, maybe, maybe I should look into this. Like, uh, you know, I don't have to pay any money for an app fee and you're telling me I'm going to get a scholarship potentially. Um, I, I'm listening. So this has a, a, a lot of potential for tapping into demographics that these colleges don't see as many kids from as as they'd like to. And the other thing is we haven't talked about, Lisa, is that the schools that love this, the ones that are usually admitting 70, 80, 90 percent of their applicants, um, a lot of times those schools they don't have the huge endowments and they really are having a hard time affording all the costs of the traditional recruitment plan. Right. I mean, it costs money to Probably buy much list cheaper, much cheaper, much cheaper. In some places, some cases, most cases, really, you're not even setting the system up. It's like an EAB or a common app or niche. Somebody's like establishing the platform. And all you're doing is is saying, yeah, I'll be a participant. I want to I want I want our school included in that. You know, and so you can save a lot of money on direct mail, on travel. I mean, you know, I'm not saying, you, you know, you get rid of all your travel and all your mail, but you can re decrease your budget and a lot of other a lot of other costly endeavors. So great question. Yeah, um, so hopefully. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks also for your comments about the podcast. Um, but hopefully. Uh, Barbara, we elucidated that for you and it's no longer confusing direct and because they really are completely different, right? Rolling and rolling and direct, like with rolling, you still need to apply. Um, uh, but it's understandable with all these times. I mean, at least how many times have people confused EA and ED and then you got to figure out EA too. Oh. And then there's an ED too. Yeah. And then now schools have, you know, people are getting creative and I support the creativity. But like, look at Georgia Tech. They have an EA deadline for in-state and out-of-state. Wake Forest has an EA option just for first gen. I didn't even talk about restrictive early action and the different variations of restricted early action, like single choice early action. Like, you know, it's, 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 it's we have a really complicated system. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's mind boggling how complicated it is to go to college in the United States of America. Just mind boggling. And to pay for it. <laughs> that a lot of places. Yeah, that is also <laughs> mind boggling. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, especially places that are 100 grand after taxes for a year. I mean, that's just so crazy amount of money. Like unless you're just uh, I mean, you know, even like in, even like double doctor families can't sometimes fathom that because not all doctors are, you know, make a ton of money. There's doctors that, that there's some doctors that make less than nurse anesthetists make. Barbara, I'm starting something new and it starts with you. We have copies of Elliot Felix's book, How to Get the Most Out of College. This book has 83 reviews on Amazon with an average star rating of 4.7. And for the first time, we're giving you a choice, Barbara. We also have Dr. Lewis Newman's book, Thinking Critically in College. This book has 27 reviews on, av on Amazon with an average rating of 4.9 out of 5. Barbara, just text me with your choice of which book you want at 404-664-4340 and share your mailing address with zip code. I'm going to give our listeners who send in a question via SpeakPipe a choice moving forward as long as we have multiple books. So send in your questions to speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. Just know we are only taking SpeakPipe questions at this point. So every week I get questions emailed in and I say, if you want it on the air, go over to SpeakPipe and record it. Just click a button and talk. Thank you, Lisa. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, in part three, our final part, or our seventh part, because we had a four-parter, Julie and I, before with Lee looking at tough questions about college admissions. But in this final part of the Dartmouth-specific interview, we continue with questions that you, the listener, sent in. We asked you to send in for Dartmouth College. Julia asked Lee, how does interest in a particular academic field factor into admission decisions at Dartmouth? Lee answers the question, who is not on your campus that you would like to see more of on your campus? 
And Lee does something that most deans of admissions and VPs of enrollments don't do. He actually reveals three of their institutional priorities that you probably don't know are priorities for Dartmouth. Lee goes on the hot seat, and he doesn't disappoint there either. I absolutely love this uh, entire interview, and I hope you enjoy the final part, Julie and I interviewing Lee Coffin. The oh. dog's been great. Oh, yeah, stop knocking on the door. Stop, Logan. Logan, stop. Stop. Wow. Logan, I'm on a Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm interested in the answer to this question as well. Logan, stop. Okay. Um, which is, um, how does a student's academic interests factor into how admission decisions are made? Um, so that's a great question. I, you know, at Dartmouth or more generally? At Dartmouth. At Dartmouth. So um, at Dartmouth, we're liberal arts and students don't declare a major for two years. So their answer to that question is interesting as we think about, um, can you, do we do we offer what you're thinking about or do we do it really well? So, you know, the student who is thinking about kind of design thinking and engineering, we're like, yep, that's our Thayer school, or they're the, or they're the environmental student writing about that. You know, so there's a match piece between academic interests and um, at the moment someone's leaving high school and looking at our curriculum and saying, yes, this is, this is a clear strength of, of our curriculum. Um, for students with more STEM interests, it's, it's, it can be more intentional, even at Dartmouth, where if you're applying and saying engineering or pre-med or mathematics, you know, we'll look at the curriculum and the grades and those courses, testing if it's there as a way of saying, okay, you're going to land in this curriculum and hit the ground running through a really fast um, calc-based curriculum. Mm -hmm. Is there evidence of success before this? Um, uh, when I was at Tufts, that was even more, you know, if you had to apply to the School of Engineering and that quantitative assessment was was linked to someone's declaration of academic interest. Um, there's no magic answer to this, though. You know, it's it's um, I think people who tell me I'm undecided, uh, that's a perfectly fine word to write down. Um, but my tip would be think about the areas that you're pondering so is it physics and theater and creative writing because if it is those are three really interesting courses of study that you should list instead of saying undecided even mm -hmm. though you are um so you know unless it's a place admitting you directly into a college or school you know your answer there is elastic and open to reimagination once you enroll Lee, who would you like to have more of at Dartmouth? We know this. No, I don't care how many applicants a school has. There's always more some that they would like ideally to shape their class out more. Voices maybe that aren't as present as you'd like to see on campus. How would yeah. you answer that? Um, so the more that we've been working towards, we've we've over the last five years, we've had more of an international presence. Um, so in January 2022, we became the sixth college university in the U.S. to be need blind for international citizens. Mm -hmm. And that was a powerful, important um, policy change that basically said global equity matters at Dartmouth. We want people to apply regardless of citizenship. And we have a curriculum that spans the world and a long history of excellence in foreign languages more students from diverse backgrounds outside the United States are welcome in Hanover. Um, so that is a growing community. 16% um, of the class that just enrolled, so we've made a big jump. Uh, we are continued. We are continuing to um, be committed to more low-income access. So our goal as part of the Bloomberg Philanthropies is to achieve 20% low income enrollment um, within the next couple of years. Um, and are you are defining they, that as, as Pell? It's Pell by the foundation. What I was just about to say is we've already achieved that if you include global in 
mm-hmm. with Pell, where over a quarter of the class come from low-income homes. But for Bloomberg, it's U.S. citizens and permanent residents who achieve a Pell. So that's an ongoing priority. And um, we are mapping um, a rural strategy mm-hmm. to reflect our location and to be more intentional about recruiting students from small communities, rural locations that we might not visit uh, each fall, but for whom Dartmouth would be a great match. So I would say those three are the kind of enrollment um, uh, institutional priorities. Yeah. That we're working on and, and awesome. Greater as you know, greater aspects of diversity. Yeah. You know, rural, low income and international. Awesome. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. This is Linda with today's recommended resource, the New England Board of Higher Education Program Tuition Break, formerly known as the Regional Student Program. This program focuses on access and affordability by offering tuition savings to New England students when enrolling at participating out-of-state colleges and universities. Currently, more than 2,700 academic programs are included at approximately 70 schools. The states participating are Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Tuition break allows students to pay rates lower than out-of-state tuition at a maximum rate of 175% of the in-state tuition. The average annual savings for a student is $8,600. To be eligible, students must be a resident of a participating state and enroll in one of the eligible academic programs. Not all programs at all schools will qualify for the discount. Tuition break is only available at two-year and four-year state colleges and universities. No private colleges are included. There is no separate application, but you do have to apply for one of those eligible programs. On the website, you can search for these programs based on the state where you live, a specific school, degree level, area of study, or by keyword. Families can find additional information at nebhe.org slash tuition break. So this has been great. This is the time we quickly transition to our lightning round and get off oh, admissions. Yeah. It'll be fast, fast and quick, but take the admissions hat off. And uh, first question is, what's your guilty pleasure? The food that's not healthy, but you just can't resist eating it. <laughs> you go to the grocery store, you grab it, you're at a party, it ends up on your plate. Potato <laughs> chips. Oh, me too. Kettle. <laughs> uh, kettle, exactly. Yes. And if it's uh, if it's kettle with ruffles and salt and pepper, <laughs> I put my face in the bag like I'm a horse at a feed bag. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Love it, Lee. You can't be in admissions. You can't even be in education. You have to do a non-education job. What would it be appealing? Uh, I would be in publishing. Oh. I am a word nerd, and one of the paths I pondered coming out of college was uh, jobs in publishing, and I love to read. Um, I'm a high school journalist and yearbook guy, and I would love to be able to edit manuscripts um, or stories. Love it. Nice. What what do you wish your 20-year-old self knew that you know now? Oh. I wish my 20-year-old self, wow, so that would have been 1983, so we're, <laughs> we're going way back. Um, you I, just told me that we're the exact same age. <laughs> yeah, so oh, yeah. I, uh, so, yeah um, my 60th birthday is next week, so... No, you're um, a little older, but... <laughs> yeah. So the... Um, what I wish that I would have said to 20 year old Lee to something that 45 year old Lee figured out, which was make sure you keep a work life balance. Don't you don't need to be an overachiever? Uh-huh. I was in high school, I was in my early career, I became a dean when I was 32. Uh, and I, I think I would have said to 20 year old Lee, play a little bit more in your 20s mm-hmm. and don't always do your homework. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> um, uh, because I was definitely someone that um, stayed very focused on. Was there like an epiphany, something that at 45 had you figured out? Uh, not so much an epiphany as a reality that, a realization that um, people around me were burning out Mm. And, and, you know, the, I think the, the little device that we all carry around in our pocket allows us to stay connected more than is sometimes healthy, Um, especially after 5 p.m. and on weekends. And I, I weaned myself off of that about 15 years ago and just said, you know, I'm going to make sure my boundaries between personal and professional are clear to me and those I work with. Um, and I think it's helped me stay well as I've progressed. So this is on that theme, favorite vacation place. Oh, my favorite, my, so my Cape Cod is my, my, my my annual destination to just unplug. But I also, um, have a pattern of doing bike trips. So I just got back from Mallorca. Uh, did a 10 day cycling trip in one of the most beautiful parts of Espana that um, uh, I um, discovered uh, on that trip. And we'll be back. Wow. Is, is there a bucket list place you would hope to get to? Uh, you know, Africa. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Africa has in my admission travels has not been there. Uh, I, I almost did for the big birthday, a safari or, uh, I'd love to go to South Africa. There's a, a bike trip there that, um, because of the seasonal difference doesn't work with the admission Dean schedule, but, uh, Africa is on the, is on the bucket list and, um, New Zealand. Cool. Cool. A book you've read that you'd recommend for parents to read. For parents to read, um, well, I was going to the, the book I was going to recommend was the Midnight the Midnight Library by Matt Haig, uh, which was the best novel I read last year about a woman on the brink of dying who goes to this library and has all these books that were different representations of the life she could have had had she made a micro decision at any point. In, it was fascinating and beautifully written um i I took out a highlighter and i I wrote down more turns of phrase from him than i have done in any other book so the midnight library for anyone who loves to read is is a great book for parents nothing's coming to mind as because i think you're asking for like a how-to book on admissions no no i wasn't necessarily asking that but but um it's okay. You gave us a book. I'm good with that. I gave you a book. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe people need to read a good novel. So, yeah, last... read a good read a good novel is yeah. sort of my. Oh, the other the other one I would I would not a novel, but um, it was based on a podcast I had discovered called In Plain Sight, and it is the um, was the audio diaries of Lady Bird Johnson during her time in the mm-hmm. White House. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. I, I'm seeing this publisher here coming out in you. Yeah. 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 Also a great podcast. And um, Julia Zweig is the journalist who found those tapes in the LBJ library in Austin, Texas. And you hear Lady Bird's voice thinking about her days as first lady. It starts on the day JFK was assassinated and goes through the moment they leave the White House. It was wonderful. If you like politics, uh, just this really interesting, very personal reflection. Good stuff. So my last question, but it's a three-parter. It's <laughs> best advice, <laughs> your best advice for students, parents, and college counselors. About 10% of our listeners are college counselors based on My best advice, advice for each of those groups? Yeah, yeah. So my best advice to all three is the same. This process that I lead at one institution is not as complicated as we all make it seem. And I think, you know, there is this antagonistic tension in the work that I would say, everybody take a step back. Mm -hmm. Remember, we are working in high schools and in colleges with 17 and 18 year olds and their parents. 
um, uh, the fundamentals of the work today are the fundamentals I learned in the 1990s. Uh, the volume has shifted. I think the media spotlight is more intense, which is why my podcast is called the admissions beat, because I think that beat distracts people and makes us think like this is something we need to be arguing about all the time. And I don't know, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I, I think bringing us back to the, that core purpose of how do you help someone see a road forward and give them a toolkit to navigate that and to realize, especially when the applications are filed at places that are very selective there are just more no's than yeses as a byproduct of volume. And being elastic in how we see quality will lead to better choices and less anxiety. Lee, you've been most generous with your time. We can two hour you podcast enough. for you. <laughs> yeah, in fact, in fact, there's only two other people that have had a two hour podcast. Oh my and, God. And we're in year six. And get, guess who those other two are? You could Ju totally guess because your lunch was probably longer than this. <laughs> it was Julia. We, we, I interviewed Julia on how to work more effectively with your school counselor about two or three years ago. And Susan Tree on the personal statement and, you know, what schools are looking for. So I guess we're all chatterboxes here as chatter podcast boxes. people. Yeah. So, so I just want you to close by telling us a bit more about your podcast. Uh, sure. Our listeners are your listeners. And then also the Dartmouth website. And if, there, if there's any social media or anything that you think is a good place, if someone's trying to get better understanding of Dartmouth, if it's your Instagram, your YouTube, just kind of direct our yeah. listeners who are like what they hear and they want to explore. Yeah. So uh, my podcast is The Admission Beat. And as podcasters always say, you can find it wherever you find your podcast. Uh, so it's on Apple and Spotify. It's on the Dartmouth website. It is not about Dartmouth. It is uh, hosted by the Dean of Admission at Dartmouth, and I pull from some of our resources, but it's about uh, selective college admissions uh, more generally. Season four debuts in mid-September, uh, and we'll pick up the thread from the perspective of a senior in high school and move through um, mid-December with episodes geared to help high school seniors make wise decisions during that um, part of their admission journey. If you listen to seasons three, two, and one, uh, three, which we wrapped in May, uh, started in January and led a junior from discovery through uh, the summer moment. And so my, one of my producers says, it's like a bridal magazine. Like every June, there's a new crop of brides. So we keep resetting <laughs> uh, the story. So, you know, we get to the end of one cycle and I go back and say, Hello, Bambies. Let's start again and <laughs> uh, meet the next crop of juniors. So that's admissions beat. Um, our website is dartmouth.edu, and you know it's a multi like like so many of us. You know you can find a lot of great information there. We're on Instagram, Dartmouth Admissions. We have our own YouTube channel, Dartmouth Admissions. Uh, and if you sign up, we have 3D Magazine. 3D is in the three dimensions of Dartmouth. Uh, which is a twice a year publication we send out to people on our mailing list that tells the story of the people, place, and program that makes this place um, what it is. So thank you for having me um, on your podcast. It's been fun talking with you today. And Julia, thank you for joining as well. I appreciate yeah. you guys. No, thank you. You make me sound cool. <laughs> <laughs> on Monday's episode, I continue with a three-parter, part three, actually, in the series I'm doing on test scores. And we're taking another look at the question, can you trust a school when it tells you it's test optional? And I'm going to name some names of schools that I personally do not trust, even that they're claiming to be test optional. We will have the final part of Lisa's excellent interview with Dr. Andrea Brenner, the author of several things, including the Talking College Card Deck series and the book How to College, which is subtitled What to Know Before You Go and When You're There. And I close out with the eighth quote of 15 
I'm leaving you from a website I found about the personal statement. This one's one of my favorites. I'm going to read it twice. And it comes from Macy Lennox, who has quite the admissions pedigree. pedigree. She has 30 years of admissions experience at a number of schools, including Mount Holyoke College, Harvard University, Princeton University. She was also a reader for Duke University, and she spent the last almost 15 years serving as an associate dean of admissions at the University of Virginia. And here is what Macy has to say. The best essays are the ones where we don't just want to admit the student. We want to take them out for coffee once they're here. We're not admitting academic machines. We're admitting classmates and roommates and kids who will make thoughtful contributions to our community. And I like this one so much it gets read twice. Once again, this comes from Macy Lennox, the Associate Dean of Admissions at UVA, her fifth school or sixth school that she has either done admissions at or read for. The best essays are the ones where we don't just want to admit the student. We want to take them out for coffee once they're here. We're not admitting academic machines. We're admitting classmates and roommates and kids who make thoughtful contributions to our community. See you on Monday, friends. I'll be coming to you from... Durham, North Carolina. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Motvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Dalianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, to send it to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is your collegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.